Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to go over chapter four. So we're going to start the chapter talking about cell theory and all of the different discoveries that had to come along in order for cell theory to develop. So before we could know what a cell was or even try to visualize it, we had to come up with a microscope. In 1609, an Italian astronomer, physicist, and engineer named Galileo figured out that if he just basically flipped his telescope around, it made a microscope so he could view much smaller things. Galileo's microscope looked something like these photos down here. It was a microscope with a concave and a convex lens. And Galileo's microscope looked something like these photos down here. It was the first compound microscope with a concave and convex lens. It had a biconvex objective piece and a biconcave eyepiece. Now, if you're not familiar with what concave and convex means, concave or a diverting lens is shaped to where on both pieces or both sides of the lens dip in. And that allows rays of light to pass through the lens that are very spread out. They diverge as they pass through the lens. Now the convex or converging lens is the opposite. Instead of both sides of the lens dipping in, both sides of this lens bow out. And that allows rays of light to pass through the lens that are brought closer together so they converge. So with this type of a microscope you're able to magnify and focus in on small objects. So after the discovery of the microscope in 1609, they gained popularity among the scientists and they began to modify the microscope that Galileo created. Around 1665, an English scientist named Robert Hooke developed his version of the microscope. Now his version of the microscope, a biconvex objective lens that was placed in the snout, and it also had two additional lenses, an eyepiece lens and a tube or field lens. Now his images came out quite dark. So what he did to fix this was he passed light generated from an oil lamp through a water-filled glass flask, which diffused the light and provided a more intense illumination of the sample. So it was able to focus better and the images were brighter. With this microscope, he looked at many types of objects and published a book called Micrographia, which was a collection of biological micrographs, and coined the word cell. Now he coined this term cells after the box-like structures he observed when viewing the cork bark tissue through the microscope. By the late 1600s, a Dutch businessman that became interested in science had developed the most powerful microscope, or I should say the most powerful microscope of that time. His microscope was very simple in design. His microscope consisted of a single tiny lens about the size of a pinhead that was sandwiched in between two flat rectangular pieces of brass with a light source he would then place a light source behind the lens to illuminate the sample. This type of microscope was capable of magnifying a sample by 300 times. Now, with his microscope, Van Leeuwenhoek was able to observe the first single-celled organisms. Now, he called these organisms animacules, but today we know that they are microorganisms. Over the next century or two, the idea of cells became more and more popular, with more and more scientists looking into them. By 1838, Matthias Schleiden, who was a German botanist, concluded that all plants are made up of cells. Most botanists of his time were not interested in the cellular biology behind plants. Schleiden was the first to do this. He discovered that not only were all plants made up of cells, that all plant tissues come from cell activity. He also began to recognize the importance that the nucleus played in cell division, though he didn't understand how. By the mid-1800s, a German scientist named Theodor Schwann 
had began looking more into animal cells. And he was able to conclude that all animals were composed of cells and that all tissues of animals were composed of cells. He also made many, many other cellular discoveries. He was the developer of the germ theory of alcohol fermentation. He discovered that most diseases that they were seeing were caused by the presence of and the actions of specific microorganisms within the body. Before that, it was uncommon for surgeons to even wash their hands in between patients. Theodore Schwann changed how they thought about contagions and that, you know, washing your hands in between treating sick people is really important, that you could be carrying microorganisms from one person to the next, which then creates the sickness. He also studied metabolism quite a bit and discovered a type of cells found in the upper esophagus called Schwann cells. Schwann cells are a type of glial cells in the peripheral nervous system that help to form the myelin sheath around nerve fibers. A Schwann cell is a cell that envelops and rotates around the axon forming that myelin sheath. Now in 1855, Rudolf Virchow, who is another German scientist, studied cell reproduction and developed the law Ominus cellula e cellula which means every cell originates from another cell. Now he was also the first scientist to perform systematic autopsies using the microscopic examination of tissue to discover leukemia, which is a progressive type of cancer in which the bone marrow and other blood forming organs produce increased numbers of immature and abnormal leukocytes, meaning white blood cells. These increased numbers of leukocytes suppress the production of normal blood cells, which leads to anemia and other issues. The scientific discoveries made by these last three scientists I've mentioned, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow, led to the development of the cell theory. The cell theory states that all organisms are made up of one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of life, and all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So every cell today represents a continuous line of descendants from the first living cells. Now, of course, cells are extremely small. Most are less than 50 micrometers in diameter. Very, very few of them are visible to the naked eye. So in order to look at cells, we have to use a microscope. Now the microscope that you will see most often is called a light microscope, often abbreviated as LM. Light microscopes use visible light which passes through a specimen and then through a glass lens, which magnifies the image and allows you to see it. Now the quality of these images depends on a few things. Number one, the magnification, which is the ratio of an object's image size to its real size. Light microscopes can often show an image anywhere from four times the size of an object to 400 times the size of the object. Now the resolution is also important. This is the clarity of the image. The clarity of the image relies on the capacity to distinguish between two separate points in space. And the quality of the image also relies heavily on contrast. Now, contrast is how well the specimen stands out from the background. If the background is really dark and the specimen is really dark, the contrast is low. But if the background is really bright and the specimen is dark, and stands out against the background, then that would mean it has high contrast. The two types of microscope slides you will commonly see are unstained specimens and stained specimens. Unstained specimens represent the natural specimen. Stained specimens have been dyed a certain color so that you're able to see structures a little bit better and more clear. The other type of microscope used to view cells is called the electron microscope. 
Now, electron microscopes are much, much bigger than compound light microscopes. They look more like a computer hooked up to a microscope. Now, these microscopes focus a beam of electrons onto the specimen and then report back an image to you. Now, the scanning electron microscope, or an SEM, focuses its beam of electrons onto the surface of a specimen, which provides a 3D look at that specimen from the outside. Now, the transmission electron microscope, or a TEM, focuses a beam of electrons that goes through the specimen in order to study the internal structure of those cells. The human body is composed of about 37 trillion cells. So you might wonder, why are cells so small? Why don't we have slightly larger cells? We don't have to have 37 trillion of them. Well, the answer relates to diffusion of substances going in and out of the cell. Cells need to quickly be able to grab molecules in and spit them back out. If the surface area of the cell were to get too large, it would take too long to get molecules in and out of the cell. So we know that the rate of diffusion into and out of a cell is affected by surface area, number one. But it can also be affected by temperature, a concentration gradient of certain molecules, the distance it needs to travel, and the size of the diffusing substance. So let's take a look at the relationship between surface area to volume ratios. Cells want to have a high surface area to volume ratio. This is because they need to be able to communicate rapidly with other cells around them, so having a high surface area allows them to do that. They also want to be able to grab in substances that they need, so having a high surface area allows them to grab substances from many areas at once while maintaining a low amount of volume. That way it's quick to move across the cell and organelles don't have to travel a long way to get to where they need to be. So if we decided to increase the size of a cell, as the size increased, the total surface area would increase, as well as the total volume. However, the surface area to volume ratio would decrease dramatically. Now you can see how this works in this image here. Let's take this cube. Let's say this is one cubic inch. Well, the total surface area of one cubic inch would be six square inches. The total volume is one cubic inch. So the surface area to volume ratio is six. If we were to take this cube and multiply its dimensions by five, then the surface area would increase to, 50, to 150, excuse me. But the total volume would almost match that at 125 cubic inches. Now the surface to volume ratio has gone down by almost six now. The surface to volume ratio of this cube is 1.2. So if this cube were a cell, its efficiency rate would just drop off the chart. This cell would be much, much less efficient than this cell. It would take a really long time for signals to be received across the cell, and it would take a long time to bring substances in and out of the cell. So it would be completely disadvantageous to be a cell that is this large, especially when you could have the same volume and 125 different cells with a much larger surface area and still maintain your surface area to volume ratio of six, the same as the original cube. There are a few ways in which cells are able to maintain a high surface area to volume ratio. The first would be by maintaining a small size as we just covered. The next would be by maintaining flat, thin, or elongated cells such as nerve cells Nerve cells are extremely thin, but branch very far in long, thin filaments. Now, the third way in which they maintain their surface area to volume ratio is by creating folds or invaginations of the cell membrane. An example of this would be intestinal microvilli. 
Microvilli are finger-like projections that form from the folding of the cell's plasma membrane. Now these projections specialize in absorption, like the absorption of nutrients that takes place in the intestine. These microvilli will face the cavity of the intestine and aid in absorption because they have a much higher surface area because of these finger-like structures. Celiac disease is a fairly rare genetic autoimmune disease that affects about 0.4 to 0.95 percent of adults in the U.S. If you have celiac disease, you're incapable of ingesting gluten because if you do, the ingestion of gluten will result in an autoimmune response that attacks the small intestine. Now these attacks on the small intestine will damage the microvilli that are responsible for absorption. Now this image shows what these microvilli look like under an electron microscope in a normal intestine cell and in a celiac disease intestine cell. A celiac disease can cause a wide variety of uncomfortable symptoms including diarrhea, abdominal pain, and gas. There are two main types of cells prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now they share some similarities but can be easily distinguished from one another based on their differences. Prokaryotic cells can only be unicellular organisms whereas eukaryotic cells can be a unicellular organism or a multicellular organism. Now, prokaryotic cells do not have a true nucleus or any membrane-bound organelles, whereas eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus and a wide variety of membrane-bound organelles. Now, their DNA is also pretty different. The DNA of a prokaryotic cell is circular, whereas the DNA of a eukaryotic organism is linear in form. Another notable difference between the two is that prokaryotic cells are much, much smaller than eukaryotic. They range anywhere from 1 to 10 micrometers, whereas eukaryotic cells range anywhere from 10 micrometers up to 300 micrometers. Both of them are capable of asexual reproduction, however prokaryotic cells reproduce by fission and eukaryotic cells reproduce through mitosis. And as we've covered, prokaryotic cells compose organisms within the bacteria and archaea kingdom, and eukaryotic cells make up the organisms in the plant, fungi, protist, and animal kingdoms. As I mentioned, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. They do, however, have a region that we refer to as the nucleoid, which is basically just the central location within the cell in which the circular DNA is held. Surrounding the nucleoid region is what we call cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the jelly-like cytosol that you find within all cells. Within the cytoplasm, you'll find ribosomes floating around, which are synthesizing pro proteins. Now surrounding the cytoplasm, or holding all of the cytoplasm in, is the plasma membrane, which is the outer covering that separates the cell from its environment. Now on the outside of the cell membrane, a prokaryotic cell may contain a cell wall, which is a rigid structure that gives the cell shape and surrounds that plasma membrane. On the outside of the cell wall, you may find a capsule. Now a capsule is a sticky layer that is the outermost layer. Now this sticky layer helps it adhere to other cells or other surfaces, and it helps the cell to keep from drying out. Now attached to the surface of the cell, you may find hair-like structures called pili. And these also help it attach to other cells or surfaces. And then last, the prokaryotic cell may contain a flagellum, which is a slender structure made of microtubules that enables movement. So we already briefly discussed eukaryotic cells. They have three main things that prokaryotic cells don't. They have a membrane-bound nucleus, they have numerous membrane-bound organelles, and they have linear chromosomes. 
Now, what I mean by organelles is basically little organs that operate with inside the cell. Each of them will have specialized cellular functions, just as your body's organs have specialized functions. Now, within eukaryotic cells, two common the two types of eukaryotic cells you're going to hear most about are plant cells and animal cells. Now, they share many similarities, however, have a few notable differences. For one, plant cells are characterized by a cell wall. So that's that rigid structure that gives support to the cell and helps it maintain its shape. The plant cell's cell wall will be just on the outside of the plasma membrane. At certain locations along the cell wall, you will find plasmodesmata. Now, plasmodesmata are the channels or the openings that connect two plant cells. Because, you know, things have to get in and out of that cell. And with this rigid structure surrounding your plasma membrane, there has to be an opening in which to do so. It's like gates to the cell. Another big difference you'll notice about plant cells is they have this large central vacuole located within it. Now this central vacuole is filled up with water or like cell sap. This thing is what maintains the pressure within the cell. It keeps, it keeps pressure up against the cell wall so that things don't pull away from it. If the cell were to be dehydrated or the plant overall was dehydrated, the central vacuole would decrease and the plasma membrane would actually pull, start pulling away from the cell wall. And of course, a plant cell would not be a plant cell without chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are what allow the plant cell to do photosynthesis. Chloroplasts are also responsible for giving the plant its green color. This is because chloroplasts contain a pigment molecule called chlorophyll, which is green. And of course, the last and most simple characteristic of a plant cell is that they'll be rectangular in shape. The rectangular shape of plant cells allows them to fit really closely to one another, and it provides a really structurally sound organism. Because if you think about plants and, you know, how much wind they have to deal with and storms that they have to deal with, they need to be a, a rigid structure. If they were made up of round cells that didn't have this plant cell wall, they would just flop over. Now, animal cells will be round in shape, as you can see, and they will be characterized by small vacuoles. You see, the vacuole in an animal cell is much, much, much smaller than the central vacuole in a plant cell, which takes up over half the cell. Plant cells will also have lysosomes, where plant animal cells will also have lysosomes. Lysosomes are like the cell's garbage disposal. They contain digestive enzymes that dispose of different types of biomolecules and even worn out organelles. Now in the plant cell I mentioned that they have um, almost gate-like structures called plasmodesmata that allow for movement of molecules into and out of the cell. Well animal cells don't have that rigid cell wall but they do have specialized junctions. These can be tight junctions whose general function is to prevent leakage of transported solutes and water. There can be gap junctions which directly connect to the cytoplasm of two cells and allows for various molecules, ions, and other things to pass through. Or they can be desmosomes. Desmosomes are junctions that provide adhesion between cells. Now, although most unicellular organisms are bacteria or archaebacteria, there are still certain types of unicellular eukaryotic cells. Two examples of a unicellular organism that is still eukaryotic would be an amoeba and a paramecium. A paramecium is a freshwater organism that's shaped kind of like a slipper and is covered in cilia that allows it to move. And an amoeba 
is another type of unicellular organism that has the ability to move because it has these pseudopods. A pseudopod means a fake foot, basically. And they're able to extend and retract these pseudopods, which allows them to change shape and to move. Now that we've covered several different types of cells, we're going to get into the components of these cells. So we're going to cover um, the different types of organelles and substances that are found in these cells. The cytoplasm is the cell's entire region between the plasma membrane and the nuclear envelope. It is composed of organelles suspended in the gel-like cytosol, the cytoskeleton, and various other chemicals. It consists of about 70 to 80 percent water, but has a semi-solid consistency because of the protein suspended within it. There may also be many other types of molecules within the cytoplasm, such as glucose, polysaccharides, amino acids, nucleic acids, fatty acids, ions of sodium, potassium, calcium, and many other elements. Many metabolic reactions will take place in the cytoplasm, including protein synthesis. The nucleus is the dark central region of a cell that houses the cell's DNA. Typically, the nucleus is the most prominent organelle in a cell. If you're looking at a microscope side of cells, the dark region within that cell will be the nucleus. Now the nucleus is held intact by a nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane. This is the boundary of the nucleus. It consists of two phospholipid bilayers. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The nuclear envelope is also continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum that surrounds portion, portions. The nucleus is also continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum which is an organelle surrounding the nucleus. The nuclear envelope will be punctuated with pores that control the passage of ions, molecules, and RNA into and out of the neoplasm and cytoplasm. So these are like the gateways to the nucleus. Within the nuclear envelope, you'll find a gel-like substance called neoplasm. Neoplasm is like the nucleus's cytoplasm. Within the neoplasm, you'll find chromatin or chromosomes. Typically, you'll find chromatin, which is the decondensed DNA form plus proteins. When a cell is undergoing replication, you may see fully condensed chromosomes. And then within the nucleus, we also have a region called the nucleolus, which is a condensed region of chromatin where ribosomal RNA synthesis occurs. On a microscope, it will appear darkly stained. It, aggre it aggregates the ribosomal RNA with associated proteins and assembles ribosomal subunits that are then transported through the nuclear pore to the cytoplasm. So I mentioned chromosomes and chromatin. Now, chromosomes and chromatin are both the DNA that is found within your cells. However, they're a different form of that DNA. Both chromosomes and chromatin are located within the nucleus, and both are composed of DNA and histones. Histones are the type of protein that DNA winds itself around, as you can see in this image. These little coin-looking things are proteins called histones. And so all species will have a specific number of chromosomes that is specific to that species. For example, humans will have 46 and fruit flies will have eight. Typically, the more complex the species is, the more chromosomes they will have. Now, chromosomes and chromatin differ because they appear during different stages of the cell's life. So, chromosomes are only visible when cells are preparing to divide. Chromosomes are just a condensed structure of the chromatin. Whenever they're condensed, they resemble an X. Whereas chromatin is visible most of the time during cell, during uh, the growth and maintenance phases of the cell. Now this is the decondensed or unwound structure of DNA, or of the chromosomes. Chromatin is basically just jumbled thread. 
or that is what it resembles. As you can see down here on the bottom, this is what your chromatin is. It's a double helix that is wrapped around histones, and as it condenses, it'll pack tighter and tighter and wind closer together to where it eventually ends up looking like this X. Once the cell has finished dividing, it'll decondense back into chromatin. So since we're talking about DNA, we might as well talk about RNA as well. So you've already seen this slide, so we won't cover it. So since, since we're talking about DNA, we also need to talk about RNA. Now you've already seen this slide, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to remind you that DNA is located inside the nucleus, whereas RNA is a copy of DNA that is sent outside the nucleus to do work. Another big difference is in DNA and RNA sequencing, you'll have a nitrogenous base that is different between DNA and RNA. DNA will have thymine and RNA will have uracil in thymine's place. Both of these will still bind to an adenine though. There are three main types of RNA. There are others as well, but we're not going to cover those. So you have messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. mRNA, or messenger RNA, is a single-stranded RNA molecule that is complementary to one of the DNA strands of a gene. This mRNA will be synthesized in the nucleus. The DNA that encodes for a specific gene will be copied exactly into RNA. And that mRNA will leave the cell's nucleus and move to the cytoplasm so that it can begin the process of making proteins. The next type of RNA is transfer RNA, or tRNA. Now this is a really small molecule. It's only about 80 nucleotides long. And the purpose of tRNA is to carry amino acids to ribosomes where they will be linked into proteins. During translation, each time an amino acid is added to the growing chain, a tRNA molecule will form base pairs with its complementary sequence on the sequence on the mRNA molecule. This ensures that the appropriate amino acid is inserted into the protein. Because as we've covered, a protein's form equals function. So if the wrong amino acid were to be inserted, the protein would not be able to do its job. There are two important regions of a tRNA to remember. The first is the anticodon, a trinucleotide region that corresponds to a complementary codon in the messenger RNA. So it syncs the tRNA and mRNA together. The other region that's important to note is a region for attaching a specific amino acid. So up here, in this image, we can see this short little molecule with an anticodon on one end and the region for attaching an amino acid on the other. The last type of RNA we're going to cover is called ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. rRNA is a type of non-coding RNA, which is the primary component of ribosomes. These are the little molecular machines that can catalyze protein synthesis. And they constitute over 60% of the ribosome's weight. Our RNA are transcribed in the nucleus at specific structures called the nucleoli. And their primary function is to bind to messenger RNA and transfer RNA to, sh to ensure that the codon sequence of the mRNA is translated accurately. So basically, they recruit tRNA to catalyze the formation of these peptide bonds between amino acids. Ribosomes are the small cellular structures that are responsible for protein synthesis. They're the component that actually assembles the protein. DNA is copied into RNA. RNA then travels to a ribosome. Then ribosomes translate RNA into a specific order of amino acids to create the protein. Now ribosomes may either appear 
in clusters or as single tiny dots. They may also be attached to the plasma membrane on the cytoplasmic side or the endoplasmic reticulum cytoplasmic side or the nuclear envelope's outer membrane. For something so important, ribosomes are extremely simple in design. They are made up of two main components. They have a large subunit on top, which surrounds the tRNA, and a small subunit on bottom. So mRNA will come to a ribosome with all of the plans for making proteins. And the tRNA will double check and make sure that the correct amino acid is being brought and matched and the ribosome will assemble the protein. The endomembrane system is a group of membranes or organelles within eukaryotic cells that work together to modify, package, and transport lipids and proteins. They stay in direct physical contact or communicate via vesicles. The organelles within this group consist of the nuclear membrane, the plasma membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, the central vacuole, and lysosomes. Since we already covered the nuclear envelope, we'll start with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer that has proteins and cholesterol embedded within it. This is a selectively permeable membrane that controls the passage of organic molecules, ions, water, and oxygen into and out of the cell. It also allows for waste like carbon dioxide and ammonia to leave the cell and may contain microvilli, which are the invaginations of the plasma membrane that we covered. The next chapter in your book is all about the plasma membrane, so we're not going to focus on it too much in this slide. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER for short, is a series of interconnected membranous sacs and tubules that collectively modify proteins and synthesize lipids. They are composed of a 3D network of intercellular elements called cisternae, tubules, and vesicles. Cisternae are these flattened, unbranched sac-like portions of the endoplasmic reticulum. They lay in stacks parallel to one another and have ribosomes on the surface. The tubules are an irregular branching element of the ER. They generally do not have ribosomes. And vesicles are the fluid-filled sac that's in... And a vesicle is the fluid-filled sac enclosed by a lipid bilayer. Vesicles are responsible for transporting proteins between the Golgi and the ER. As I mentioned, there are two main functions of the endoplasmic reticulum. It modifies proteins and synthesizes lipids. However, these two functions take place in separate areas of the ER. We have the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER is named after the rough appearance it has because ribosomes are attached to the cytoplasmic surface. The rough ER is responsible for synthesizing secretory proteins like hormones and synthesizing membranes. It also is involved in the modification of proteins and the transportation of proteins. After ribosomes transfer their newly synthesized proteins into the rough ER's lumen, they then undergo structural modifications such as folding or acquiring side chains. These modified proteins incorporate into the cellular membranes of the ER or other organelles' membranes. If a phospholipid or modified protein is not destined to stay in the rough ER, then they will be bound into a transport vesicle which will take them to their new location. The smooth ER is continuous with the rough ER, but typically has no ribosomes on its cytoplasmic surface. Functions of the smooth ER include synthesis of carbohydrates, lipids, and steroid hormones. It's also involved in the detoxification of medicines and poisons from the cell, and muscle cells have specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulums called sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
Now, these are responsible for storing calcium ions that are needed to trigger the muscle cells' coordinated contractions. So we talked briefly about how vesicles can bud from the ER and that their contents would be transplanted. So we already briefly covered that vesicles can bud from the ER and transport contents to elsewhere. But before reaching their final destination, the lipids or proteins within the transport vesicles still need to be sorted, packaged, and tagged so that they all end up in the right place. Sorting, tagging, packaging, and distributing lipids and proteins is the job of the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi can be thought of as like the cell's post office or shipping center. It didn't create the packages that need to be shipped, but it does need to make sure that they're packaged correctly and that they end up in the right spot. The Golgi is composed of a series of flattened membranes. Now this series of flattened membranes has two faces. It has the cis face, which faces towards the ER, and this is the area that vesicles are transported into. It is the entryway into the Golgi apparatus. And then on the opposite side, we have the trans face, which is the exit face. This is where vesicles leave the Golgi and travel away. Transport vesicles, which are formed in the ER, will be carrying different molecules to the Golgi. These transport vesicles will fuse with the cis face of the Golgi and empty their contents into the Golgi apparatus's lumen. Now these contents will travel through the Golgi and undergo further mod modifications that allow them to be sorted. Once modified, they will then tag with phosphate groups and other small molecules in order to travel to their proper destinations. And last, the modified and tagged proteins will be packaged into secretory vesicles that will bud from the Golgi's transface. These secretory vesicles can transport contents to either somewhere else in the cell, or they can fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents to outside of the cell. Now the Golgi apparatus in plant cells have an additional role. In plant cells, the Golgi is responsible for synthesizing polysaccharides, some of which will be incorporated into the cell wall. Lysosomes are small, round organelles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes are degradative enzymes designed to destroy pathogens and break down excess or worn out cellular components. Or in other words, lysosomes are the waste removal system of the cell. Now the way they are able to do this is that these hydrolytic enzymes have a much lower pH than the cytoplasms. Therefore, it's much more acidic and is able to break down these extra components. instead of one large central vacuole like plant cells. Now plant cells may also have multiple smaller vacuoles that also may Now plant cells may also have multiple smaller vacuoles that also aid in water storage, cell rigidity and structure and cell elongation. Some may even contain enzymes that help break down macromolecules. Now, if you remember what I said earlier about the central vacuole maintaining the cell's shape and how if the central vacuole were to lose water, then the actual cell would recess inside the cell wall. The plasma membrane would pull away from the cell wall. So these photos at the bottom show you examples of this. This is a turgid cell. Now, that means that the cell is completely full of water. It is in a hypotonic state, meaning it is filled as full as it can be. Turgor pressure is the pressure that plants use to remain upright. If the turgor pressure drops, then your plant will be dehydrated and it will start falling limp. Now, if a cell is extremely dehydrated to the point that it becomes a hypotonic cell, 
meaning that all of the water has left the cell, it'll look like this on the right. It'll be a plasmalized cell. Peroxisomes are small round organelles enclosed by a single membrane. They carry out oxidation reactions that break down fatty acids and amino acids. They can also detoxify many poisons that may enter the body. Plant cells may contain many different types of peroxisomes. Now, these peroxisomes may play a role in metabolism, pathogen defense, and stress response. Now, the way peroxisomes work is by oxidizing amino acids and fatty acids that generate a toxic hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is then broken down into a catalase, and catalase can form crystals within a peroxisome. So if you look at these peroxisomes under a microscope, you may see a large dark mass. Well, this is the crystalline core, as you can see over here as well. You will often hear the mitochondria referred to as a cellular powerhouse. This is because they're responsible for making ATP, which is the cell's main energy carrying molecule. In mitochondria, the process of cellular respiration uses oxygen and produces carbon dioxide as a waste product. The carbon dioxide that you exhale with every single breath comes from the cellular cellular reactions that produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Now there will be more mitochondria found in certain cells than others. Mitochondria will be found in a higher concentration in muscle cells because your muscle cells need a considerable amount of energy to keep your body moving. Mitochondria are oval shaped double membraned organelles. They have their own ribosomes and DNA and each membrane is a phospholipid bilayer embedded with proteins. The folded inner layer is called a cristae, and the area surrounded by the folds, the mitochondrial matrix, both of which have different roles in cellular respiration. Now a really neat thing about mitochondria is they actually contain their own DNA and their own ribosomes. Like the mitochondria, chloroplasts have their own DNA and ribosomes too, although they fulfill an entirely different function within the cell. Chloroplasts are found in plant cells or in a few other types of eukaryotic cells. This is the organelle that is responsible for carrying out photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a series of reactions that uses carbon dioxide, water, and light to make glucose and oxygen which is the major difference between plants and animals. Plants are autotrophs and are able to make their own food, whereas animals are heterotrophs and must ingest their own food. Chloroplasts are also double membraned organelles. Within the inner membrane is a set of interconnected, stacked, fluid-filled membranous sacs we call thylakoids. Each thylakoid stack is a granum, or if there's plural, it's called a grana. And the fluid that surrounds these sacs is called stroma. And as I mentioned earlier, also within chloroplasts is a green pigment called chlorophyll, which is the pigment that's able to capture light energy and drives the reactions of photosynthesis. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts support the endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory postulates that chloroplasts and mitochondria used to be prokaryotic cells that became trapped in evolving eukaryotic cells. Now, this theory is widely supported because of the evidence presented. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts contain plasmid DNA and ribosomes, which are two things that typical organelles shouldn't have. And plasmid DNA is also the type of DNA found in bacteria. Now second is that both of these organelles are similar in size to bacteria and divide by binary fission, which is also how bacteria divides. Now the way this would have occurred is through a symbiotic relationship. A symbiotic relationship occurs when two organisms from separate species depend on each other for survival and mutually benefit one another. 
endosymbiosis is a mutually beneficial relationship in which one organism lives inside the other. So we believe that host cells and bacteria formed an endosymbiotic relationship when the host cells formed in vaginations and ingested both aerobic and autotrophic bacteria. Through many millions of years of evolution, the bacteria that was ingested became much more specialized in their functions with aerobic bacteria becoming mitochondria and autotrophic bacteria becoming chloroplasts. The cytoskeleton is a network of protein fibers within the cytoplasm that provides structural support, shape, and in some cases locomotion. The cytoskeleton is composed of three types of fibers, microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Microtubules are small hollow tubes. They are the cytoskeleton's widest component with a diameter between 23 and 27 nanometers. They help the cell resist compression and provide a long track in which vesicles can move through the cell. During cell division, they also pull replicated chromosomes to opposite ends of the dividing cell. Microtubules also compose the structural elements of flagella, cilia, and centrioles, and in animal cells compose the centrosome, or the microtubule organizing center. Now microfilaments are the smallest or most narrow protein fiber found in the cytoskeleton. They range anywhere from 4 to 7 nanometers in diameter. Now, microfilaments are small rod-like structures that aid in cellular movement, provide cellular structure, and aid in cytoplasmic streaming. Intermediate filaments are branch fibers that's diameters are in between microtubules and microfilaments. They're approximately 10 nanometers in diameter. Intermediate filaments play no role in cellular movement. However, they bear quite a bit of tension and maintain the cell's shape. They also anchor the nucleus and other organelles in place. Think of them as cellular scaffolding. As I mentioned, microtubules form centrioles in animal cells. They occur in pairs that are perpendicular to one another and create a cylindrical shape. Within a centriole, you will find nine sets of three microtubules arranged like you see here on the left. Now, a centrosome is the microtubule organizing center of an animal cell. They're what makes microtubules and control where they go. Now, a centrosome is composed of a pair of centrioles. And the centrosome will duplicate before division and will act as the motor that pulls duplicated chromosomes apart. Microtubules also compose the major components of flagella and cilia, which are structures that enable a cell to move. The flagella is a long hair-like structure that extends from the plasma membrane and enables an entire cell to move. Now some cells may have just one flagella or they may have multiple flagella. In this bottom left image, you can see a flagella on this organism. And on the right image, you can see these tiny hair-like protrusions that are called cilia. Cilia are short hair-like structures that move entire cells or substances along the cell's outer surface. Now they can extend along the entire plasma membrane surface. Now, despite their differences in length and number, flagella and cilia share a common structural arrangement of microtubules called a 9 plus 2 array. This means that they are made up of a ring of nine microtubule doublets surrounding a single microtubule doublet in the center. Now, this image in the top right also shows a little bit of how they function. Flagella operate like a propeller. It spins in circles while cilia move back and forth. If you want to take 
A closer look at flagella and cilia, check out this YouTube video down here at the bottom. Now these next couple of slides I'm going to skip through relatively fast because I already mentioned um, that microfilaments aid in pseudopod movement and they are also responsible for the cytoplasmic streaming within a cell called cyclosis. But this slide just gives you a better um, visualization of what that looks like and what they're doing. The same goes for this next slide. Um, these intermediate filaments work like scaffolding throughout the cell, and they hold these organelles in place so that they're not just, you know, kind of floating around and falling down with gravity. So now we're going to talk about a few extracellular structures. By now, you should definitely know what a cell wall is. It is layers of polysaccharide that provide structural support and rigidity to the cell. In plants, the cell wall is primarily composed of cellulose. In fungi, the cell wall is primarily composed of chitin. Bacteria and um, types of algae use various different polysaccharides. Plasmodesmata are structural modifications that provide a channel between adjacent plant cells. This channel enables them to transport materials from cell to cell and thus throughout the plant. Now a tight junction is a watertight seal between two adjacent animal cells. This tight junction prevents materials from leaking between the cells. These junctions are typically found in epithelial tissues that line internal organs and cavities. Desmosomes are also only found in animal cells. They provide a strong adhesion between cells. You can think of them like spot welds between adjacent epithelial cells. Short proteins in the plasma membrane connect to intermediate filaments to create these desmosomes. Gap junctions are the animal cells equivalent to plasmodesmata. They provide channels between adjacent cells that allow for the transportation of ions, nutrients, and other substances. Gap junctions develop when a set of six proteins, called connexins in the plasma membrane, arrange themselves in an elongated donut-like configuration, called the connexin. When the connexin's pores and the adjacent animal cells align, a channel between the two cells will form. On the outside of an animal cell, you'll find a collection of proteins, the most abundant protein being collagen. And these collagen fibers will be interwoven with protogliens. Protogliens are a carbohydrate-containing protein molecule. Now, collectively, we call all of these materials an extracellular matrix, or an ECM. This ECM allows for other cells to communicate with one another. This is because in a cell's plasma membrane, there will be protein receptors on the extracellular surface. When a molecule within the matrix binds to a receptor, it changes the receptor's molecular structure. The receptor, in turn, changes the microfilament's conformation position just inside the plasma membrane. These conformational changes will induce chemical signals inside the cell that will reach the nucleus and turn on or turn off the transcription of specific DNA sections, which also affects the associated protein production, thus changing activities within that cell. In addition to allowing for communication, the ECM also forms a protective layer over the cell. Blood clotting is an example of how the extracellular matrix's role in cell communication works. When the cells lining a blood vessel are damaged, they display a protein receptor, which we call tissue factor. When tissue factor binds with another factor in the extracellular matrix, it causes platelets to adhere to the damaged blood vessel's wall, which stimulates the adjacent smooth muscle cells in the blood vessel to contract, which constricts the blood vessel flow and initiates a series of steps that stimulate the platelets to produce clotting factors. 
Now these last two slides in this chapter's PowerPoint are just a review for you. We're not actually going to go over those again because the entire PowerPoint is about them. So uh, you may be expected to label some of these components. So I would definitely learn what the major organelles are and what they look like. And that concludes chapter four. I hope you have a great day.